we're late. Very good. Okay. Welcome everyone uh, to our uh, This Cycling Life webinar. We're just going to give some people a little bit of time uh, to come on. Um, so while we're doing that, I'm going to just uh, open up our little slide pack, our intro. Uh, so I see people are uh, now joining. Just give us a second. Very good. Okay. Uh, just give us a minute and now uh, people, people join in. Amy, have you got this under control? All this it's all under control, Mick. It's all under control. You guys just keep smiling. People will be coming on, so they'll be looking at you. Uh, for those of you who are joining, you know, Mick and I and uh, Alan have had a few rehearsals, but uh, Alan tends to be a little bit serious, so we, we need to, in the, in the feedback Q&A box there, if you see Alan looking serious, you need to give him a little bit of a prodding uh, over, the course hands, of, <laughs> over the course of the next, <laughs> next few minutes. That's good. I see people still joining in. Excellent. Yeah, we're super excited today, folks. We, uh, we, we just started promoting this webinar about a week, week and a half ago. Uh, it's incredible that we've got uh, attendees coming in from more than 20 countries, uh, over 250 registrants. So yeah, super, super exciting, uh, super exciting for all of, all of us. Um, I will say a few words. Um, I see more and more people starting to, to come on live now. Just some practicalities about the Zoom platform before we talk about the topic of the webinar and, and how we're going to interact with each other. Um, for those of you who are new to Zoom, um, if you wave your pointer at the bottom of the screen, you'll see several options there. Um, you have a chat option, you have a Q&A, uh, and you also uh, have a little hand raising. Um, because of the high numbers of people on the, the webinar today, we're, we will actually be muting your microphones and video. Uh, but we do really, really want you to interact with us. So if you would like to do that, to post a question at any time, actually, during the webinar, just use the Q&A box. We won't be using the chat today. Um, so that's, uh, that's quite uh, important. Um, also, uh, we will have towards the end of the session, we'll give you a hashtag, uh, hashtag this cycling light. Um, so if you have questions that we don't get to um, during this piece uh, of the, the session, then you can certainly reach out to us after the workshop and we'll try to uh, respond to those questions within 24 hours uh, of the live session today. So see people uh, still coming in. Uh, good. Excellent, just a minute to go now. Excellent, uh, good, we've got 70 people already online. That's terrific to see. Welcome everyone, if you've just joined us. If you have just joined us, as I've mentioned, uh, we're using Zoom today. We're gonna to be using the Q&A box. If you'd like to interact with us, just uh, type in the Q&A at the bottom. All right, it's 10 o'clock uh, in the morning, our time here in Europe, so we're gonna get started. Uh, before I introduce my co-hosts, um, I'd like just to say a few words uh, about why we're here. Um, the focus of today's webinar um, is really on peak performance for, for Masters athletes. Uh, we'll be talking about goal setting, we'll be talking about training uh, and lots of other stuff. Uh, and as I said, we really want this to be interactive. Um, we'd also like to say thanks uh, to a few people. Um, Mitch Docker, of course, at Life in the Peloton and pro rider with EF Education First, who has given us some awesome support over the last week, uh, promoting us on social media. If you haven't listened to his podcast, uh, Life in the Peloton, it is fantastic. So we really recommend you to do that. Um, we'd also like to thank guys like uh, Roman Kreuziger, um, Serge Pals, uh, Sam Buley, uh, Nicholas Roche, who've also supported us, uh, also great friends of mine like Sven Thieler, thank you Sven, uh, who've also promoted us over the last few days. So thanks to all of you. Um, what I'd like to do now actually is introduce my co-host. So Alan, over to you. Would you like to introduce yourself to everyone? Thanks Jamie. Hi everyone. Good morning. Um, hi, I'm Alan Davis. I'm living in the, in the Basque country in the north of Spain. I'm currently a technical advisor for the UCI. A uh, former professional road cyclist and also a high performance coach. Excellent. Thanks, Alan. Over to you, Mick. Good morning, all. My name is Michael Rogers. I'm coming from uh, the south of Switzerland where we speak uh, Italian. Um, I'm part of the team NTT coaching staff. Uh, I was also a professional cyclist for around 16 years. 
Excellent. Thanks a lot, Mick. Now, of course, we, we've put in some big investments to prepare for this webinar. As you can see, you know, we're all, we're, we are all under lockdown. We're working from home. We told Alan two days ago that he needed a haircut. So if you see the, uh, the incredible locks there, uh, he's actually done that himself. We've also done a little bit of work on the backgrounds at our houses. Um, Mick had a rather scary painting behind him in his office when we did the rehearsal. Mick, do you actually have that painting there? Would you? Yeah, just put that up for a I'll second. Just grab it just a second. Opinion. You know, when Mick won the world championship, he actually had a portrait made of him uh, by a, a, a painter who paints for the, uh, the Italian royal family. There it is. Mick, I think you should put that away, mate. I think that's a little bit scary. <laughs> anyway, let's, um, let's jump into it. Mick, you coming back? I am. You're right. Good stuff. Good stuff. All right. So um, what we're going to do, actually, we're going to jump in and we're going to, going to jump into the first topic, um, which is really around uh, goal setting. So, you know, Alan, you and I have been working together for, gosh, a little over four years now. Um, and I, I'd like to hear from, from you to talk a little bit about, to our audience out there, about as a coach, you know, how do you sort of analyze the strengths of a rider? How do you work with them to define goals and then bring that all together? Well, basically, as you know, Jay, um, we we have a we have a situation where we need to find all the information about you. Um, I mean, as a as a client, you know, um, it's not only about um, your cycling training; it's also about your your life, your life uh, in, in in general. You know, um, your your family ties, uh, how much time you know you have to train regarding that. Also, your work how much time you're also putting into your work and anything else basically that would affect uh, training time, for example. We gather a lot of information regarding those things and uh, then we set realistic goals, you know, and then we put the plan in place to go to those goals. Yeah, yeah, good. Uh, and, you know, when, when we, we met each other, you know, one of the things you certainly wanted to get to know about was just my physiology. I mean, maybe, maybe you can talk a bit about that. That for you was kind of the starting point, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, we have, uh, we spend a bit, a bit of time on, you know, getting to know each other, you know, you as a, as a cyclist, your characteristics. Um, and then it's my job as a coach to, you know, to strengthen those, those characteristics and also strengthen your weaknesses, um, you know, to achieve the goals that we put in place for you. Uh, you know, I, I learned pretty quickly that you're a punchy rider. Um, you know, you're a strong time trialist on your day. But you know, we also we also worked on your 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 tactical nows as well from from your track racing background, which which comes into play with uh, with the tactics side of things as well. Yeah, yeah, good. I mean, Mick, I'm sure you can you can say a few words about that. I mean, uh, you know, when when you look at the world of cycling, you have guys from you know the Chavez kind of 50 kilogram, very lean, right up to the Tom Bonin, big, powerful guys. I mean, for you, how important is, is, is that really understanding the physiological aspects of a rider? And, and what does that mean for our audience who are amateurs who are, and are often, you know, not coming from a pro background? Because one of the things that I heard, you know, early on when I, when I started cycling, you know, some, I asked a coach many years ago, you know, how do you become a top cyclist? And, and he said to me, choose your parents very carefully. So, so what percentage of it is kind of physiology versus, you know, the training and the discipline and that kind of stuff? What's your view? Well, every athlete's uh, very different, Jamie. You know, we have all, we have tall athletes, we have shorter, we have, we have thin guys, we have muscly guys. Um, what, even at the top of the sport, you know, just repeating what Alan said and, and touched upon is, is there's, there's quite a lot of planning going on. And you're seeing, you know, all right, where are the where are the points of the season where you want to perform well? Where are your goals? You know, what time availability do you have? And then we we specify and, and create a, a training program uh, based around that, based on the type of physiolog physiology that you have. And it's it's all about checking, you know, checking, training, maybe having a quick test, doing a quick time, maybe a, could be a, a Strava segment, seeing, you know, is there progression over the season? And then we adjust the training up. Okay. I mean, that's an interesting comparison, I guess, for the amateur athletes, particularly the people who are listening to this, because, you know, of course, pro riders, they have a pretty good life, right? Because they, they eat, they sleep, they train. Yes. Um, but for, for folks like, like me and, and many of the people on this call, you know, we have work, we have family. And that was something, Alan, that, you know, you also really checked in with me was, okay, you, you assess me as a rider. You know, this is your physiology, your strengths. 
Um, and then what you did was really ask me all these questions about, you know, how much time do you have per week? You know, what sort of, what, what is, what is your wife and what does your family think about this cycling passion you have? Maybe you can talk a bit about that, Alan, how you also factored in those aspects. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, we're not, uh, you know, a lot of people on this call will relate to this as well. You know, we're, we're not professional cyclists. We're all not professional cyclists with all the day to train, to do our training. So we have to take that into account. And, uh, you know, as a good coach, you need to take all the varieties that, that there is in one's life and then plan the picture around that. Um, you know, for, for example, if someone's doing manual work, I have to take that into account for the recovery as well. You know, as someone sitting in an office putting in on during their work, you know, it's all, it's all the varieties as well. And then the family life as well. There's no need being world champion if, you know, if your family situation or lifestyle is going in the opposite direction. We have to take that all into account, make sure we've got goals in, in every sector of those, of those sec sections that we just spoke about, you know, that our family is committed as well. Our life, our life goals as well are going in the right direction. Also, our cycling is going in the right direction to our goals that we plan. Yeah, super important. And uh, Mick, I'm sure. Actually, before we even move on, you know, that, that's you know, I'm I'm extremely lucky. You know, my wife Anna me is 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 very supportive. But actually, it's all about you know, for us, it's all about give and take. You know, we 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 kind of sit down usually it's usually the time of year, maybe October, November each year, and and we have a talk. You know, and and you know, I say, look, Anna me, you know, maybe I want to shoot for this goal next year. Um, you know, as Alan knows, 2017, that was the World Championships, the, the UCI Grand Fondo Worlds. Um, other years, it's a bit different, but, you know, we have that discussion and, and, and then we, we, we agree, you know, we create sort of a contract around that. So um, that's also something which for me was very interesting, Alan, in that, you know, when you and I talk goals, we don't talk goals just for next season. We're talking goals three, four, sometimes even five years ahead. Um, which as a master's athlete, I really believe in because I've, I see that I've got 30 years of cycling ahead of me. What's your view on that, Mick? I mean, that, you know, is it enough just to have goals for the next season or to what extent do we, even as amateurs, need to think about that longer term picture? Well, I mean, without getting too nerdy here, uh, because maybe this isn't the place for it. I mean, I can talk about this stuff all day, but you have, you have, you know, if we can think of it in a macro cycle and then you have your micro cycle. So, Absolutely, it's particularly when you're talking about in building endurance and building speed, it's year after year that those, um, those things increase. But saying that, also having some kind of micro goal, seasonal goal, where you can focus in on a short, short time and really get in there and, and lock in and, and try to achieve that fast. But again, year after year, you know, you're putting down kilometres and improving yeah. year after year. I mean, Alan, I think you can remember, uh, you know, when we went to Albi, you know, which you coached me for, and, you know, I was like in the form of my life. It was, it was amazing being there. Uh, but in the end, I crashed out, right? So I didn't end up anywhere near the podium uh, at the Worlds in France. But, you know, I think you remember afterwards when you and I were at the finish line and my little boy Charlie came up, you know, and the kids were really disappointed for me. And, you know, my, but my son Charlie said, Papa, don't worry. You know, they, they've introduced a 100 plus age group category. So just keep trying, you know, eventually everyone else will be dead and, and you'll get there, you know. So, but actually, you know, I laughed, but actually he was right. Because as a master's athlete, you know, I feel sometimes we're in too much of a hurry that we don't keep that perspective. Alan, maybe you can talk a little bit about um, our great friend, uh, Keith Oliver, who we met in Manchester last year, 78 years old. I mean, what, what you know, as a pro athlete yourself, then meeting someone like Keith, what was that experience for you seeing a guy like that at 78 still going strong? Yeah, it's a, it was, it was, it's a good question, Jay. It was, um, for me, it was, it was amazing to see, you know, Keith, I, I knew him, you know, as, as a legend and, you know, the legend he, he, he still is as a bike rider and what he did. He's also raised up near my hometown of Bundaberg and Maribar as the six days. Yeah. And to see him still, Headbutting and shouldering, you know, his opposition at, at 78, you know, to win a world championship, uh, you know, as of last year in his age group was was inspiring. And uh, yeah, definitely it, it showed me, uh, you know, there's no, there's no, uh, there's no age limit to, to stopping, you know, if, if, if the fire's still in the belly, still give it a crack. And it was uh, definitely passionate to see that. And that's, that's a good, I mean, you mentioned the fire in the belly, Alan, because, you know, uh, I know a lot of us are, you know, sort of struggling right now with 
with the COVID-19 lockdown and, and motivation and stuff. And yeah, someone asked me a few years ago, like, Jamie, how are you staying motivated? And I mean, the reality is for me, I don't have a difficulty staying motivated because I just love this sport. You know, it's, it's not like some little spark in the dark for me. It's like, it's really a burning fire. So I'm still waking up at six in the morning, getting on my indoor trainer. You know, I don't know when my next race is going to be, uh, but I love my bike. But saying that, you know, I, I do sometimes back off because of life pressures, you know, family pressures and other priorities have to take precedent. So I find that much easier if I keep that long-term view. I've got many years ahead. Mick, what about you? I mean, how, how do you, you know, think about motivation, desire? How important is that, you know, for a rider? And the other thing, of course, is maybe obsessiveness. You know, I'm a little bit obsessive. Does it help to be a little bit crazy as, as, a, as an athlete if you want to perform well? It that? does, yeah. I think you have to have a little bit of a crazy streak in you to be able, you know, to push those limits sometimes. Um, but it's, I mean, it's times like this, I mean, everyone's in this period of uncertainty during, during this COVID-19 uh, period. And, you know, for me, it's, it's just a fantastic time to go down and, and, and use this time where you may be locked up in home to go check on some of those things that, you know, some of those things you just put to the side yeah. over the last couple of years, go revisit them, maybe work on your, your pedaling efficiency, work on your sprints work on some of those things that all those sh I should do things now is a fantastic time to, to, to pull those out of, of, of the drawer and, and revisit them. Yeah, cool. The, the other, I guess, last aspect of this one, you know, around goals and stuff. Um, actually, before I said that, you know, I should say a funny story because I do say, you know, my wife under me, she's very supportive and stuff. Um, but I never forget uh, back in like 2015, like I had this really bad crash in Mallorca. I was on a descent, I lost control, I crashed, I broke 10 of my ribs, I punctured my lung, I was really, really messed up. And I remember you know, sitting there beside the road and the first thing that came into my mind is, my wife's gonna kill me. <laughs> you know, it was like, because of that, because, because actually she, I do realize how many sacrifices she makes and, and how many sacrifices the family makes. So, yeah, I try not to fall off too often because that does also affect, you know, the family uh, a lot. Um, but, you know, the, the last topic I guess we'd like to talk about under this goal setting one is around, you know, Alan, you were very, very specific with me saying, Jamie, based on your physiology, you know, you're punchy, you know, you've got a high lactate threshold, you're a good sprinter. You, you really pushed me to really select events that fitted my capabilities um, and not to do events or, or aim to do well in events that you really felt didn't fit my capabilities. So that was very important for me because I get a sense with a lot of amateur riders that I know, you know, I meet guys who, you know, maybe they're 90 kilograms, they only have seven hours a week to train, but they set this goal of themselves of doing the Transalp or something, you know, 160 kilometers every day with 3000 altitude meters. And I'm not saying that's not, not good because you can enjoy it, but if you want to compete at a high level, then I think it's more about specificity. Well, what do you think, Nick? I mean, you know, is it, is it okay just to, you know, just choose any goal or, or, or what, what, what's your view? Uh, I think there's two elements to this, Jamie. And one is, like you said, the enjoyment period. I mean, we all love to get out there and ride on our bikes. But to bring it back to, to the performance that you mentioned, you know, there are certain types. Just, just, just one second, one second, Mick. Alan, you're looking very serious, mate. Can you cheer, can you get that smile back on your face, please? We're here to have fun, Alan. Come on, man, loosen up. All right, sorry, Mick, go ahead. Me no. laugh, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just worried people are looking at Alan, they're like, oh, geez, he's getting all serious here. We're not here to be serious. Uh, sorry, sorry, Mick, go ahead. You're no, you're right. I was, I was just saying, you know, there are certain events. For example, um, I was a great time trialer. You know, and, and, and during my career, I spent a lot of time doing what I did best and yeah. focusing on my brilliance than spending too much time spending on my weaknesses. And there's a fine balance there. Um, but from the performance side, I think we see, uh, we're seeing a lot of riders spending too much time training in endurance. Uh, Yes, of course, we need endurance, but we also need to need to remember, you know, what what wins us races or what helps us perform. Yeah, I mean, we have a lot of uh, we have a lot of people from from Belgium here today joining us, and you look at the typical Kames race. Okay, yeah. you know, it could be what, eighty kilometers, ninety kilometers long, um, and you're looking at between sixty to to 90, 20 second accelerations. 
So going out for a nice three, four hour endurance ride isn't very productive to that type of racing or that type of effort. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. And I, I think, again, Alan, going back to, you know, when you and I started working together, um, you know, we have had years like 2017 where, you know, I, I pretty much took a sabbatical from work. I lived like a pro. I had 20 hours a week to train. So, of course, I can get into the kind of form there to race these multi-day stage races, you know, the Judo Sardinia, the, the Mallorca Challenge, you know, and I can do that at a high level because I've got 20 hours a week. You know, last year for me, work was really busy. So I had more like eight or 10 hours a week. So, you know, Alan said, Jamie, go for the time trial at the European Championships. You know, that there's a 90K road race there. It's a bumpy one, it suits you. But don't expect to race Poland at 160 kilometers and do well. And that, that for me really helped as well because I am competitive. But what I started to realize was that I could be competitive even at an international level if I adjusted those goals to fit with the time that I had available uh, and the other pressures in life. So, Alan, you know, um, when, we, when we talked about that, you know, you, you, you also said, Jamie, you know, it's okay to step back from time to time or to downscale your goals. Is that a way, is that something you need to do with every athlete that you're coaching? I think so, yes. Jay, it's, um, you know, you have to be realistic, like going back to, to what I was saying before, like taking in all the information in one's life and yeah. then making realistic goals. You know, one year you, you're able to train more than 20 hours a week, the next following year, yeah. because of work, you know, that cut, cut, cut in half. So we adjust our goals to suit your available time to train. Yeah. It's, it's basically common sense. And, and, and for you as well, it was amazing, you know, what, and, and for me as a coach, what we did in terms of results with, with the time we had to train, you know, we re readjusted our, our training to do a lot more intensive work for the, for the short intensive races, our goals, you know, and also, you know, your work was progressing in hugely as well at the same time. So going back to what I said before, you know, your work goals were, were going in the right direction as well as your cycling and your family was still in the, in the, right, in the right place as well. Sure. Yeah, that, that's super important. And I see, hey, Alan, you got some you got some comments there from Justin McMullen in uh, Tassie, who reckons that you're looking. Oh, yeah. You're thinking about your seventy five year old comeback. He reckons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'll be uh, a. Yeah, there's there's plenty of time, Alan. Plenty. But that was very funny because in Manchester, you remember, uh, I, I raced the uh, the twenty k points race, you know. And I was dying, but I, you know, I managed almost to get inside the top ten in the final. And then at the end of the race, Keith, Keith came up to me and said, Jamie. You did okay. You keep doing that. You'll get there within the next 20 years. And it was fantastic. It was just great because I thought, yes, he's right. You know, we have that, that horizon. So um, it's good. Please keep the questions, comments coming in, folks. We, we really love that. Thanks, thanks for the interaction. Um, maybe it's time to move on a little bit um, because, Mick, you know, you said something very interesting. You know, you talked about the, the, the Kermis racing that we do here in Belgium, right? And you mentioned, you know, it's for me at Masters, it's 70 kilometer race. It's an hour and 15, hour and 20. And that's what amazes me because, you know, I have a lot of buddies here in Belgium and they're on Strava and I see they're doing 400 kilometers a week, but they're doing most of those hours in like heart rate zone three and four, you know, tempo, sweet spot kind of riding. Um, and what I start to understand, Alan told me, he said to me a few years ago, you know, Jamie, it doesn't matter if you can hold 300 watts of power all day. If you can't do 510 watts to bridge across to the breakaway, if you can't produce 1200 watts in the sprint to win from a small group, you're not going to win. So Mick, can you maybe say a few words about that? Like, like this, this obsession with endurance in road cycling and particularly for a lot of people on this call who are, who are probably doing a lot of hours of training, but maybe aren't really optimizing their training to balance that difference between endurance and intensity. Yeah, sure. I mean, before, before I dig too deep, I'd just like to take a step back. And from a physiology perspective, whether you're the most top athlete in the world or, or you're just, you know, the ordinary kind of Joe who has, you know, a couple of hours a week, you all have, two, we have two, uh, if I can say, engines. Yeah. Uh, so what we call endurance, which is predominantly aerobic work. So, you know, going out for long rides, nice steady pace. And then we have our anaerobic capacity, which is your sprints, your ability to jump into a breakaway or, or bridge across to the gap. So if you look at your typical commerce race, the majority of that race will be in your anaerobic um, capacity engine. Let's say it like that. And I have a, I have a saying is, 
if it doesn't happen in training, it's not happening in racing. So as you know, if you are focusing in on shorter sprint style races, it's very, very important that your training stimulus starts to look something like what's going on in the actual races. Yeah, yeah very good. And Alan, again, over to you. You know, that's, that's something you said to me early on. You know, you said, Jay, you train for the hardest part of the race. Can, can you say more about that? Because, you know, like, like I mean, if I, we talk about what, what happened with me in Casablanca this year with the UCI World Series, right? Because I wasn't training for endurance because I had a busy period over the winter. I was training, however, for the scenario that someone would try to go in a break early on and that I needed to have that high power to bridge across, but not necessarily once I bridged across to ride at the front all day because I hadn't had the endurance base for that. So can you talk about that, Alan, about how you, you know, because for me, actually, I started having nightmares. You know, you were giving me these incredibly tough, you know, <laughs> protocols, um, even over the winter to build up that power. So can you talk a bit more about that, the role of gym and strength training and stuff like that? Sure, mate. Um, for example, you know, the race you're talking about was a, was a two, hour, two hour effort, you know, two and a half hour effort maximum. So basically our training was designed to, to match that effort. Uh, what I did after, you know, and also taking in mind your, your base training is not only what you did in the winter this year, it's over what you've done the last few years. So you had enough base and strength training behind you to cover that two and a half hour effort easily. So it was more designed to specifically training, um, you know, precisely for, in an intensive effort you know we were we were doing a lot of intensive sprints um a lot of short efforts uh and taking in mind as well jay with this and that you have naturally as well and what we've spoken about before is the tactics coming into play as well you know like i'd more i was more than confident with you coming into a finish in a small breakaway or, or a big group you know you'd know where to be in the in the last 200 meters to get a good result you know from that tactic tactical background and also the tactical nous during the effort to save your energy for for the final for the yeah. final sprint you know and and, yeah, and this example but, but mate I, I was dying eh? I, I, everything was cramping eh? cuz i cuz i had, i didn't have the endurance training behind me right so i, yeah. I was suffering man I, there was every single muscle was cramping but, but the point was i got there right i think that's the important yeah. point is is that if you, like I said, you know, if, if you miss that split, if you're not there at the front, front end of the race, it doesn't matter if you can ride at 300 watts all day. It, those 400 Ks a week, they don't matter. And that's, I think, what we see. So Mick, you know, uh, yeah, we, we talk, uh, there's just some other questions coming in. You know, I, I, the, Martin Cook raised the question about how to best train for a really long race with 5,000 meters of climbing. I think Mick, you've already talked about that already, right? And what, what Alan and I do, we, we literally analyze the race profile. So we look how long is each of those climbs over the course of that race. And we prepare our body to do those climbs. But that's not enough because what you've also got to do is benchmark the other riders who you're up against. So when Alan and I in 2017, you know, when we were preparing for the Worlds in Albi, we got on Strava and we stalked some of the top guys. You know, we looked at who, who won in Perth the, the year before. We looked at guys like Sam Smith, Lucas Catapodas, Bruce Bird world-class guys we looked on strava and we looked what is their five minute power output what's their 10 minute power output what's 20 minute look like what's per kilogram and those were my goals because at the end of the day if i can't hit the same numbers as those guys can do and do those efforts on that race circuit then i'm going to be in the chase group i'm going to be behind mick can you say a bit more about that this idea of you know not just looking at the race profile but benchmarking your competitors because we're not racing against pros right i mean we're racing against other masters athletes what's your view on that man uh, it's it's a good question because I, I think there's again two sides to this you can really get in there and benchmark and, and there's so many good sources of data out there now you know like if you look on strava i mean i'm sure most of our view our viewers here today know about training peaks and they've got a lot of data in there but you can, you can look up simple tables, uh, even online, about, you know, master cycling and what's required to win. All that information out there is in abundance. But it's about, and I agree very much uh, with you, Jamie, it's about getting in there, understanding what the course profile is, what are the characteristics required to perform in such a race, and then simply working backwards to, to build that condition over time. 
Yeah, great. And, and that's, um, yeah, so again, I think that relates back to what, what you know, Alan and I were talking about with Casablanca this year with the UCI World Series. We looked at that profile. We said, that's probably where the early break is going to go. These are the kind of numbers you're going to have to put out, Jamie, because these are the other guys in the race. And, and that, was, that was it. That was kind of the benchmark. And just, so, I just add one thing to that. Yeah, go ahead, Nick. Uh, yeah. as, as more and more information um, becomes available to us, you know, we have this abundance of information really at all out there. Yeah. But underneath that, we're all, always dealing with a human. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it's very important that we, we listen to our bodies. And if you wake up one morning and your legs, you can't get out of bed because your legs are so sore or you can't walk down the stairs, maybe it's time to also say, listen, put the numbers aside. I'm going to take a rest. I'm going to have two or three days easy. Listen yeah. to your body. It's really, really important. Yeah, Alan, I'd like to hear from you on that one because, you know, that was, that was one of the things, again, when we started working together that really impressed me about you. You know, you were, you were constantly telling me, Jamie, your hard days are only as good as your easy days. It was a mantra. And so much, because there was a question here from somebody about how many intervals can you do a week? What I started to understand from, from you, Alan, and Nick, I'd love you to jump in on this one, is we kind of work on almost like an 85-15 ratio. Now, that will vary depending on the number of hours you're doing, but what does that mean? 85% of my training is very easy, actually, really easy. Sometimes zone one, zone two, it's really easy. 15%, 10, 15% of it is really hard to do these kind of efforts you have to do, these intense efforts in the race. The problem, of course, is that the way most amateur athletes train is we do far too many hours in this kind of middle zone, like zone three or whatever you want to talk about. Um, and you don't think it does, but actually it builds up fatigue. So if you don't do this really easy stuff, in my experience, you don't have the energy to do the really hard stuff. Alan, you want to talk about that and how you brought that philosophy in with me? Because I felt sometimes I was being really lazy with my training, actually. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly right, Jay. I think I found personally the same. I, I, I felt that a lot of you know, amateur and master competing athletes were, were doing the same or, or, or committing the same mistake is, is not recovering. Um, you know, that was the biggest issue with a lot of people. You know, they were going out and doing the same same rides every day without putting a recovery day in there to improve from, you know, whatever rides they were doing. So it was a philosophy that, you know, it was taught to me as a young rider. But, uh, yeah, if you're not recovering from your hardest efforts, you're not going to get the benefits from those efforts to, to also start your next process. Yeah. So it's and also, I, I'd like to hear from Mick on this one, because the other thing, Alan, you know, Jamie, is you said to me, Jamie, you're not 23 years old, right? And, exactly. and that's also super important. You know, I, I'd worked with other coaches before and they were training me like I was a 25 year old guy and I'm not, you know, I'm almost 50. So it's also very important that you have to realize, you know, as you age, your, your, your body does need, it really needs that recovery. Um, but sometimes I also get almost like, I, I get like, what do you call it? Like, um, I get these people on Strava who, who like give me a hard time because they, they're like, oh, you must not be uploading all of your rides. Like, how can you compete at this high level with so few hours of training? Really, people are like, like harassing me, like saying there's something wrong. So there's this real mentality that if, if you're not doing 400 Ks a week, 300 Ks a week, whatever, you can't compete at a high level. And Mick, I don't know, but, but I completely disagree with that. I think you can perform the high level with less hours if you get this balance between recovery and intensity. Yeah, it's an interesting one. I, I mean, I think we all grow up in cycling with this kind of endurance bias. You know, if you're getting out there and doing, you know, your three, your four, your five hour rides, you know, you're tough, you know, you're really strong, yeah. right? But personally, I've never been in a race where we've just gone easy the whole way. And, <laughs> and then, you know, we kind of get to the line all ha holding hands. <laughs> you know, yeah. we're in there, we're in there attacking, we're in there sprinting, you know, the, the wind's coming in from the side. You know, we have to get ready for battle here, guys. Right. And doing too many slow endurance rides where you're out there for hours, constant speed, you know, everything's under control. Yeah. I don't think is the right recipe for, for performing at your best. And there's a question there from, from uh, Paul Connolly around, you know, monitoring your, 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 you know, your fitness and fatigue and stuff. Okay, these tools are really useful, you know, Strava, training, peak, stuff like that. But actually, I think it goes back to what Alan, you know, said, you know, if you, if you feel crap, if you feel tired, if your legs are hurting, then it's a signal and you listen to that. 
Um, the other thing, Mick, I think interesting, you and I talked about the other day was that actually even many of these training tools like Strava and, and Training Peaks, the algorithms that they're using to tell you how well you're doing have an endurance bias. Right? You do loads of kilometers and Strava is going to tell you you're fit. Well, actually, when I look at my Strava, like last year, it tells me I'm a loser, you know, like, like you're at the lowest of low because I'm comparing that data to what I did in 2017 with 20 hours of training a week. But actually, I had some great results last year. So I think we also have to be very careful with some of these algorithms and stuff. Or what do you think, Mick? I mean, is that... Yeah, is that sure. I mean, they're, they're low-based algorithms. So they, they give a bias to staying out there for hours. Um, but I think also a very important one, and, and we've touched upon it, is, is, is monitoring yourself and, and listening to your body. Yeah. But I like to even tell, you know, the guys I'm coaching in NTT, write things down. Yeah. You know, have, a little, have a little notebook where you can write things down to say, I did, you know, these sprints today and they felt great. Yeah. Yeah. And go review it. You know, go have a look at over your notes every, every couple of weeks and just... Have a little reminder that you know, you know, I, I, you know, you can put the pieces together. I did sprints, and then I did some uh, one-minute efforts, and then I did some accelerations out of the corner, and you can see these patterns starting yeah. to to establish. That's why it's really important to write things down and, and remember them. Very, very good. Uh, th there's another question there. You know, coming in, uh, Aaron Strong asked, you know, but did you get these results on ten hours a week because you did those? previous you know months or so of 20 hours a week yes i think mick you've mentioned that you know the training is cumulative so we're not saying that it's not good to go out and you know build that base over time um, it is cumulative uh, however it's not the only way you know to train and and, and you know a base in itself is, is is not enough we don't want to get too technical with the training stuff we can answer those questions with you guys later we'll we'll follow up also with your questions um, there was a question there around tapering or something like that, but it just comes back to the, the recovery piece. You know, you really do need to let your body recover and that's extra true, I guess, you know, before you're, bef you're coming up to that race day, you know, you need, you need to give yourself the time. The other thing, interesting on the race diary, right, Alan, because that's something you really push me to do, but not just for how you're feeling physically, but also the tactical stuff. Alan, do you remember that Kermis that I did in, in Belgium? I think it was near Mechelen, Baum somewhere. And I'm in a breakaway with these two Flemish guys. Do you remember? Yeah, I do. And, and Alan's thinking, Jamie's doing great. But then he starts thinking himself, uh-oh. Because if you're in a break with two Flemish guys and these two guys know each other, something bad's going to happen. And don't get me wrong. Flemish guys are normally quite nice people unless you put them in a bike race. And then something nasty happens. And sure enough, right, Alan? Do you want to talk about what happened? How these guys started working me over and stuff? Yeah. And yeah, it's the old one-two trick, isn't it, Jay? It's not only, you know, in, with, in Flemish races or with Flemish people. Um, it's the old one-two, you know, if you come into... Oh, the Flemish, Flemish, Flemish people are much worse. I'm <laughs> only, you know, I, I should tell you that. Eh? <laughs> They're normally nice people, but you put them in a bike race and something happens, mate. Anyway, go back to your story. So tell, tell us about the old one-two. What, what happened to me? Because I wasn't prepared for it. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you're in a situation with three guys and you're one against two, um, you'll find... You'll start, uh, one will attack, and then you'll have to chase him back while the other one sits on your wheel. And then once you get hold of the, the first one to attack, the other one will attack. And it'll be like a one-two effect, you know, and eventually you'll wear, you'll wear your, your energy down and then uh, they'll take over. And uh, yeah, unfortunately, tactics will, will prevail like on most races does. So uh, going back to... Yeah, but, um, the, but, the worst, but the worst bit, Alan, was that not only did they work me over and drop me, you know, I was so dead that I got caught by the peloton and I didn't even end up, you know, after 12 laps on the front in a 13, 14 lap race or something. It was a disaster. Yeah. Um, but I learned from that, right? And the, the point that you were making is, Jamie, learn from that. And then you gave me the tactical advice. And actually, that happened to me in races after that. But I ended up on the podium because I didn't make the same mistake twice because I, I learned from it. I wrote it down. So I think that's a super important point that I got from both of you guys, right? Which is, is, is this importance of reflecting on your experience, on the way you're feeling and writing it down. Mick, so, you know, was that something you did throughout your career, Mick? Did you, did you keep that diary? Did you? Yeah, I did. I, I mean, over the years, I, I moved from an analogue 
you know, version, little book that I always carried around in my suitcase and lost dozens and dozens of times. But then, you know, as technology, you know, comes online and platforms like Train Peaks and et cetera, et cetera, today's plan, you know, you can get in there and write those things down and they're, they're everywhere. Yeah, it's important. I see that there was a question from your own, uh, Jeroen van Gottenhoven, good, good buddy of mine, saying don't, don't blame the algorithms behind Strava and training <laughs> people. It's the people who write the algorithms. But that's a really good point because, you know, one of the things I see with a lot of my amateur buddies is they're working with coaches, really good coaches, but actually many of those coaches are using principles from 10 years ago. You know, lots of base miles and, and, and sweet spot training and stuff. So that's one of the other things that I've really respected in working with you two guys is that you, you know, you retired from cy pro cycling five years ago, but you really keep yourself up to date with these, you know, polarized ideas, micro intervals, which Alan and I have been bringing into my, my workouts recently. Um, so I think that's a challenge, isn't it? That, that keeping up to date and, and not just making sure you're up to date, but your, your coach is up to date. There's another question there around, you know, do these principles also apply for people who are not competing, um, who are just joining their local friendly group rides? Well, I don't know about you guys, but for me, the local group rides are usually equally as competitive as racing. Yeah, so um, Alan, on that one, you know, you, you probably come from guys who just be beating their mates right are the, are the same principles applying here yeah exactly no I, you know I, I coach people um now and previously as well you know they're not competing cyclists they just want to improve their cycling their general cycling and so they're basically competing against it themselves so yeah. you know improving their own times on a hill or on a flat or or whatever it may be um it's yeah. not only for you know competing masters or social cyclists also for general people who just want to improve their general fitness and their cycling you know it's using uh using a coaching platform to improve their their well-being yeah and i think this comes back to you know i think most of us just want to be the best we can be and whether that's competing exactly. or just on the weekend and all these yeah, all these the moment, are like for that because you know it's not about it's not about maximization it's about optimization. How do you optimize the time you have available to the best you can be? Uh, Alan, there was a question saying, so, so what should you do when those guys start doing the one-two on you? Tell them what you should do, mate, because that's what you told me, and, and it fixed my problem after that. Yeah, well, basically, you've got to sum up the situation on uh, you know, how far to go on the bike race, whether, whether you can get to the finish line, you think you can get to the finish line, or how far the guy behind it, it comes. There's a lot of verities come into play, but uh, the first thing is to do just just show show strength and, and sit on the wheel and, and and make sure you try and get can if one goes, make sure you try and get the other guy to, to work with you. If he's not working with you, just go straight behind him and say, "No, I'm done." And then eventually, he'll either he'll do one thing: so he'll he'll start riding and, and bring his mate back, or his mate will stay there by himself. And you'll have an opposite. You'll have an opportunity for a group to come behind, and then you you know reassess the the race once the group catches you, and you know eventually you get more numbers come from behind, and then you can work together and get the guy, get the guy back, and then you still have more more energy to to get a result at the end of the day. Yeah, look, look, I, 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 a little while after this happened, uh, a few, few months later, I, I was down in South Africa, and and you know you think working with Flemish guys is scary. Racing skimming, try racing against South African guys. And I was an individual rider racing against a team of seven guys. And I ended up in a breakaway with three of them and one of me. And these guys were trying to work me over and work me over and, and they didn't drop me. They didn't drop me because I followed the, 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 the rules that Alan had shared with me. Um, I never knew Master. I, I, did, I, did, I didn't win in the end, but I got second on the podium against a group of three guys. I and I was pretty pleased with that. But if I hadn't have had that, if I hadn't have written that down, if I hadn't had that up, it wouldn't have happened. So, so a couple of rules here. Watch out for Flemish guys and South Africans. That, that goes without saying. <laughs> Nick, I just want to, I just want to come in with, with a bit of advice as well that I found over the years as work as a professional athlete and now as a as a coach. Jay was yeah. so much more data and you know and devices nowadays. I mean, I mean, Mick, you can also you've gone through this as well. I, I know personally, but. There's been, there's been times where there's just been too much and there's nothing wrong with just going out for a ride with no devices either and just enjoying bike riding and for what it is. 
and, and getting refreshed mentally by doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, there's so, so many guys get so fixated on data, it actually affects their performance. There's nothing wrong with going out and riding a bike without any devices, no data, and refreshing and resetting again. Mick, you, you know, we've done this as, a, as professional athletes as well. Yeah, sometimes, I mean, I've, I've been in periods of my career where the data is more important than the form you know, is, is getting its condition right. So you're going out there trying to achieve higher numbers. Yeah. Whereas the end goal is, is, to, is to get the condition, the physical condition, and the numbers are simply a result, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, trying to get the highest fitness score on, on one of the relevant platforms, maybe in that day, is not the right thing to do. You know, yeah. It needs to be a combination. You know, there's, there's not one perfect data source for me. Yeah. It's yeah. a combination of them all. Exactly. Yeah. With the okay. underlying foundation that we're humans and we need to feel good. We need, we, you know, we need to have a positive feeling and, and positive outlook and a positive motivation. Um, yeah. We've got, we've got a comment there actually on that one from, from Ross West. Um, thanks, Ross, who, who's asking about the mental psychological stuff. And again, that's something which really, Alan, you worked on with me, which was just self-belief. You know, a part of it was all the training and everything, but you always gave me this sort of, you know, I remember when we raced the Giro Sardinia together and you were on the motorbike, you know, 150 meters back from the race, I had the earpiece in, just those words in my ear, you know, Jamie, you can do this, mate, you've prepared for this, you know, you, you, and I'm racing against guys 20 years younger than me, but I believe, but there's another aspect of this actually, because I, you know, I also work in the field of leadership. Um, and of course, we, what we understand sometimes is also the body can trick the mind into changing its view. So for example, you know, before I go into a race, I will stand, you know, after my warm up, like Casablanca, I was doing this, right? I was crossing the finish line, right across the finish line with my hands in the air, um, power posing. Because when you do that, when you physically put your hands up, that, that boosts dopamine release in your system, it triggers endorphin release. Because when any human being wants to feel powerful, they make themselves big. So don't be shy. Don't be shy to do that, you know, before going into a event or into a race. And the other thing, Alan, certainly, which, you know, in Manchester was just visualization, you know, picturing yourself going across the line for first. So, Ross, that's a super good question um, because it's not just what happens below the waist, you know, the legs, the power. It's also what's happening up here. Mick, do you have any tips or tricks for people on how to boost that positivity or positive self-belief? Well, that's the thing. I mean, think of it in terms of a computer, right? You can have the fastest hard drive, you can have the fastest uh, memory, but if you haven't got the CPU to drive it, you know, the CPU is missing. Um, the hard drive isn't going to move fast at all. Right? Yeah, right. But here we're coming back to what we touched upon at the start is, is having a balance. This is really important. You know, if you start to have too much weight on one side of the boat, it's going to tip over eventually. You know, yeah. so it's spend your time training, have your good recovery, you know, uh, have a family life, have a social life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very and, and, Very and, yeah. and my experience from, I mean, I was professional for 16 years and, and when I look back and reflect on my career and, you know, it was the years where I had balance mm. that I had the best results. Very, very important, Mick, and I think especially for the audience, you know, we're talking to here and, and that's something, you know, I, again, I, I've mentioned it throughout this talk is, you know, I, I really believe that life is long and, and that, you know, we can put pressure on ourselves. But the reality for most of us on this call is that we're juggling these three balls. And what are the three balls? It's our career. It's our family, our relationships with other people. What do we want to give back to society? Whatever it might be in terms of that broader self. And then there's our sport. And what I've come to understand is it's very, very difficult to keep all of those three balls really high in the air all the time. It's almost impossible to think that you can be thriving in your career, being a great mother, father, you know, parent, uh, husband, wife, and being a high performing athlete. It, it's it's, it's, it's oh. too much pressure for you. So, you know, what Alan and I always talk about is like, okay, which of those two balls are we going to work on this year? Because you can keep two of them, I think, in pretty high up. So last year for me, clearly, as we said, it was more family and work. Cycling was a bit less. I'm still competitive, but I, I targeted 25 kilometer time trials, not 160 kilometer road races. So 
I think, Mick, that's terrific advice, right? It's, it's about the balance and, and how we do that. I hope that, that sums it up. Guys, I'm aware of the time. Um, and thanks so much to everybody out there who's been giving us these questions. There's been a few questions about diet. Um, so I think probably we'll come back to that one in the next webinar. We've definitely, Alan gave me an incredible amount of input on, on nutrition, supplements, all that sort of stuff. We come back to that one. Sorry, we didn't get to it. Um, what I would like to do, I'm just going to share my screen for a second. Uh, let's go back to the slides there, and then we're going to close up. So yeah, we would like, again, as I said, um, to thank all of you um, for being here. Um, you can connect with us. Uh, we're all on social media, LinkedIn, Twitter. Don't hesitate to reach out to us, uh, to send those questions to us. Uh, as I said, we'll be using the hashtag on Twitter, this cycling live. So any of you use that hashtag, uh, we'll check that over the next 24 hours, come back individually um, with some answers for you. Um, what I'd also like to do is thank a guy behind the scenes. We've been supported terrifically uh, on this webinar by my friend Raman Deep Singh, who's sitting in Mumbai. If any of you are thinking about running a seminar like this yourself, running a webinar, don't hesitate to reach out to Raman Deep. Also, our overall sponsor, Speaker Ideas, the speaking agency based in Amsterdam, uh, we'd like also to thank them. They provided the platform for us here. They've also um, helped us um, with some promotion. So with that, uh, we're going to draw to a close in the moment. Alan Davis, thanks for smiling, mate. We were a bit worried. We were worried, dude. We thought the serious, you know, uh, koala face was going to come on. You, you did well. Last words from you, Alan. Last, last words right. of wisdom for, for everyone. No, thank you to you, Jamie, as well, and Adi back in at home in, uh, in India. Also to you, Mick. Um, yeah, I mean, thank you to everyone who signed up to the set to the, to the webinar. It's it's been great. I mean, it's it's uh, something that that I take a lot of pride in, you know, and passion is uh, coaching now, and also just giving back to the cycling community and uh, and what knowledge that we've we've gained over the years. Cool, Alan, and you know, the piece of wisdom because I mean, you know, I, my piece of wisdom that I never for, forget from Alan Davis is your hard days are only as good as your easy days. All right? So that, that's, that's my little piece of wisdom that I'll take in there. Or the other thing that Alan, the other thing that Alan has told me, which I think is really from a, a former sprinter is only work as hard as the least hardest working guy when you're in the breakaway. That's yeah. another, another gem. I love that one, Alan. Thanks. For that. that's, that's, Nick, just, that's just a typical sprinter thing. You that's know. a typical sprinter one. So thanks, Nick. Mick, from you, last words of wisdom? If it's, oh, if it's not happening in training, it's not going to happen in training. Uh, if it's not, sorry, let me start again. If it's not happening in training, it won't happen in racing. Okay, excellent. Thanks a lot. Mick, can you just show us that painting one more time, mate? Can you just, just put it up? Come on, I love that painting. So uh, it's always special. We've got to end with life. My piece of wisdom um, for all of you uh, is, of course, life is long. So, oh, Mick, I think yeah. you should, you know, that, that's going to scare people. It's going to scare people. All right. So, yeah, my piece of wisdom, everyone, life is long. Um, remember you're juggling those three balls, but uh, have self-belief and don't, uh, don't, don't, don't hesitate to chase those dreams because uh, everything is possible, everything's achievable, uh, and especially when you've got the support of amazing guys like uh, Alan and Mick. So personal thanks from me to you two because you've been such a huge part uh, of what I've been doing over the last few years. Okay, we're going to come to a close here. Um, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. I really hope you enjoyed it. Uh, and we would love your feedback also uh, in the Q&A before we leave. If you want to put some comments there for us. And we look forward to, to welcome you to the next Welcome to This Cycling Life uh, webinar, which should be in about two weeks from now. We'll reach out. So goodbye, everybody. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Everyone, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.